Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to introduce today's session and panelists. We will be discussing supporting loved ones with kidney disease, the tale of a care partner. And this afternoon, you'll hear from our panelists about their experiences as care partners of loved ones with kidney disease, and also learn about resources they found and are available for care partners to use. My name is Elle Lee and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a kidney patient. I had kidney failure from IgA nephropathy when I was 26 years old and I was on dialysis for three and a half years. Uh, my mom was my caregiver and without her care and support, my recovery from dialysis and transplant would have not been possible. So I personally understand how important and essential caregivers are while going through kidney disease. As a licensed therapist, I specialize in anxiety and depression, and I provide mental health therapy for adults with uh, mental health therapy for adults and kidney patients. I'd like to introduce to you our first panelist, Deborah Cook. And Deborah is a compliance and concerns coordinator by profession. She is a mother of five boys and provided support as a care partner for her husband, Kenneth Cook. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Next, well. we Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Nicole Rochester. Dr. Rochester is the founder of Your G GPS Doc, where she serves her community as a professional healthcare advocate and health equity consultant. She is a board certified pediatrician and provided support as a care partner to her late father. Welcome, Dr. Rochester. Thank you so much, Elle. It's great to be here. And our final panelist for this session is Sashay Walker. Sashay provides private chef services at Field Performance Kitchen for professional athletes and high profile clientele. Her experiences as a care partner for her son Aiden inspired her passion to be a rare kidney disease advocate, and she provides valuable tips on how her community can eat healthier. Welcome, Sashay. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And we look forward to hearing all about your experiences as care partners for your loved ones. Now, before we get started, we would love to hear from you. So I encourage everyone who's joining us to please type your questions and comments in the chat box to the right. We will try our best to get to your questions during the Q&A segment of this talk. Now, to start us off today, I'd like to turn it over to Deborah to tell us about her experience as a care partner for her husband and discuss the details of her journey. Hi everyone. I am so excited to be here today um, because I definitely want to share my journey that I had with my husband and um, how I was uh, I supported him as well as my support. As they stated, my name is Deborah Cook. I'm a compliance and concerns coordinator working for a wonderful company. I have five wonderful, wonderful sons. It was easy, as I stated, I was a caregiver for my husband, and it was easy to be a caregiver for my husband because my husband has always been a great provider and great to our family. So that was very easy for me to uh, be able to be his caregiver, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and his supporter. I... Um, became a caregiver. My husband suffered from uh, diabetes and uh, kidney failure for years. So uh, when he went on peritoneal dialysis, that's home dialysis, my main responsibilities at that time was to um, just make sure his supplies were uh, readily available as well as um, making sure that his meds that the doctors administer were the right ones. I monitored him all the time just to see if they gave him a different med, how it affected him, or if they, um, during his um, bi-weekly visits to the doctor, I told them how he was doing, because um, I am such a speak up person about anything that I see that should be changed. Um, so I was always there helping him out. Um, some of the, um, but first let me tell you more about the other responsibilities that I had. Once he <clears throat> became a um, hemodialysis patient going to the dialysis center, 
uh, at that, my roles changed at that time. Um, he, he had recently been amputated, did not have any prosthetics, and he's a double amputee. So I was having to take him to dialysis every other day. So um, I would have to get someone to help, literally help put him in the vehicle, and uh, we take him to the dialysis center, get him out of it, and back and forth. So I could see how emotionally draining that was on my husband, because my husband is a very independent person. So it was um, it was very hard on him. Um, once my husband got his kidney transplant from a great person, uh, John Sato, who was just awesome. Once he got his kidney transplant, then my roles changed because I didn't have to have that responsibility at that time of um, having to get him to dialysis or, uh, dialysis or anything. But as a person who has a servitude attitude, I was always there just to make sure that he was um, had um, the right meds. I'm big on the right meds because if you don't take the right meds, your body is not going to react to uh, different things. Now, granted, my husband is like that, too. So he'll make sure he has the right meds, but he won't at, at times speak up you know, to the doctors and say, this is not working, but I will. I say, it's not working. We've got to try something different. So that's how I supported him after his uh, kidney transplant, um, which helped ease some of the um, the stress at that time. Um, some of the challenges that I experienced, my main challenges were uh, mentally and emotionally, because I get so involved when I'm caring for someone or helping someone. Um, physically, it was a challenge, but not as much because I had my five boys there who, um, no matter when I called them, I don't care what time it was or when or what they were doing, they dropped everything and they came to help their dad. Um, that, and that I appreciated of them so much, um, because they know how I am. I'm kind of squirmish on, uh, blood and stuff like that. So they would always come and help me out. Also, I had uh, support from my um, two of my sisters, well, all of my family, but my sisters. One sister actually came down and um, stayed with us because when my husband first uh, had his, um, was starting to have all these issues with dialysis and his legs, we went all over Southern uh, of the United States trying to save his legs. So at that time, I, we had a son that was a senior in high school. And um, I'm sorry, he was a junior in high school. And um, my sister came down and actually stayed at our house for over three months while we tried to save my husband's legs. And so I had great support in that way. And But the mental and emotional one was like a roller coaster. It was up and down, up and down. So I, through the help of God, and I prayed to God a lot to, uh, to ask him to help me to get through, uh, through the help of God and constantly communicating with my doctors, uh, talking to my husband, talking to friends, any friend I had that was a doctor in the medical field, I constantly called them anytime my husband um, had an issue. So not only was I getting advice from his doctors, but I was getting advice from all of my friends as well. I, uh, <clears throat> that's pretty much what my uh, journey of supporting uh, my husband was. It was a, a experience that I will uh, never, never forget. And I really um, am so excited to be able to share this with anyone. And that that way, maybe it will help someone else in the future with their journey. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Deborah. You know, just as um, you were sharing your journey, juggling multiple roles while balancing working and caregiving responsibilities can be emotionally and mentally draining. Yes. Um, so I think as care partners, it's easy to forget to take care of yourself. 
Um, and so I, I like to just share this reminder for all the caregivers out there that to take care of yourself too. You know, even if it's a quick 10, 15 minutes each morning or whatever the time allows for that day, make it yours, you know, and use this time to do something that makes you feel good, whether it's stretching, going for a walk or just some alone time before starting the day. Um, you know, this isn't about taking a break, but it's about making your heart and your mind strong so that you can continue to be there for those who need you. Um, so every day it's like giving yourself a little recharge so you can keep going with love and energy. Now, um, Deborah, I'm curious um, if you could share what were some helpful resources that you came across and how did you find them? Okay. First, I want to say um, when you were talking, it brought, I brought, I thought about this. Uh, during our transplant um, trips, we had to go at one time every week. So we, I am such a positive thinking person. So I never looked at that as a, oh my gosh, I've got to take my husband to another uh, doctor's appointment. They were always, we were on a date. I looked at it as we're going on a date. We're going to drive this hour and a half. We get to be with each other. We get to talk. So I always looked at that as a date. So that really helped me. And I hope that can help someone else. Um, my resources were, I Google a lot. And of course, the doctors would tell me, stop Googling, Deborah. But um, I Googled a lot. Uh, Anything um, that I, I felt was um, adverse, had an adverse effect on my husband. And then I contacted my doctors. Um, another um, resource was my company. That's why I said I work for a wonderful company. When my husband was very ill, and I hope I don't tear up, but when my husband was very ill, I um, was running out of uh, sick leave, vacation, and I get a lot of vacation. I've been with the company for 40 years, <clears throat> so I get eight weeks of vacation and a couple of days. So I had plenty of vacation. I had a lot of sick leave, but that tells you how sick my husband was because I had literally used all of that. And my coworkers in HR and in compliance compliance as well as legal, they all band together and they donated me two weeks to take me to the end of the year so I can replenish my um, vacation. So I um, use my friends, my family, my work family, um, and just um, any other resource. Um, I talked to my husband's nurses and doctors. So we all became friends instead of a nurse doctor relationship or a patient nurse or patient doctor relationship. We actually became friends because they allowed me to call them when my husband had any issues. Yeah. And I think to your point, um, tapping into our community is so important as caregivers um, to be able to utilize other supports so that we can you know, when we become overwhelmed emotionally or mentally. Thank you again for sharing your experiences. Now, um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Rochester. You were the caregiver for your father, and can you share with us your experiences of being a caregiver with a medical background? Sure. Thank you, El. It's great to be here. My experiences as a caregiver were like like Deborah shared, you know, both beautiful and challenging. I say it was literally the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life. And I've, I've done a lot of difficult things in my life. Um, I'm a pediatrician by training. Um, that's my dad in the center of that photo. Um, so my late father had a lot of chronic illnesses, including diabetes and uh, hypertension or high blood pressure and uh, heart disease and several other conditions. But his diabetes and his high blood pressure were unfortunately not well controlled. And ultimately um, he started to experience complications, one of which was end-stage renal disease. And so for about four, four plus years, four to five years prior to his death in 2013, he was a, a dialysis patient and uh, kind of in the middle of his dialysis journey, his health really started to decline rather abruptly. And so my two older sisters and I became his caregivers. And, you know, in hindsight, I realized that in those moments, those early days, weeks, months, I didn't identify as a family caregiver, um, even though that's, that's absolutely what I was. 
Um, but but what we did, so there were three of us. So I'm very thankful. You know, Deborah mentioned the help that she had with her sons and her other family members. And I was blessed to also have assistance. And so my two older sisters and I, it took us a little while to kind of figure out who was going to do what. And honestly, we were kind of stepping on each other's toes and there was a lot of um, duplicate efforts being made. And then eventually we figured it out. And so one of my sisters, the, the non-medical older sister, she uh, kind of took over my dad's like house and the real estate part and, and figuring out um, what we would do with this home because ultimately we moved him into an assisted living facility. And then my other older sister who is has a healthcare background, she um, took over kind of my dad's finances and making sure that his bills were being paid. And then I, as the physician in the family, was in charge of overseeing his medical care. And so, you know, at the time that this transition happened to caring for my dad, I had been a pediatrician for quite a while. And so I thought that was going to be like easy. I thought I got the easy part of the deal, but it was extremely difficult. It was extremely frustrating. Um, and really what I found is um, how difficult it was to navigate the healthcare system, how much I had to advocate for my dad in medical settings, um, speak up on his behalf, similar to what Deborah just shared, um, getting the healthcare professionals to listen to him, getting them to listen to me, um, and really just um, uncovering a lot of um, some errors. And you know, he was on a lot of different medications, some of which were um, duplicative and they were causing side effects. And so my primary role was really going with him to his medical appointments, sitting at his bedside, in the emergency department, visiting him in the hospital and updating my sisters and other members of the family. Um, and at the time, you know, I had uh, two elementary school age children. Um, and so balancing motherhood with being a caregiver to my dad, I was also working full time as a physician in a busy hospital. And so it was very challenging for me to um, really balance. And, and I don't know that there's any such thing as true balance, but trying to be the best mother that I could be, trying to be the best wife that I could be, trying to be the best doctor that I could be, and also be the best daughter and caregiver. And, and sometimes there, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. And so um, there were times when I was just feeling completely overwhelmed with all of the responsibilities and feeling like when I was caring for my dad, I'm letting my daughters down. And when I'm taking care of my daughters, I'm letting my dad down. And, and what about my coworkers? And, and so I think it took me a while to really just kind of understand that um, there may be some times and some days when, when certain things in my life take priority over others and embracing this idea that it's not, balance is not like this equal share, but that you know there were, there were days when my dad needed me more than my kids. And there may have been days when my kids needed me more than my dad. And so really kind of settling into that caregiver role and um, and being able to show up as, as best that I could in each of those scenarios, I think was, was really important for me. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, Dr. Rochester, is that it's difficult to find the balance and sometimes in, in certain moments, certain priorities take over others. And it's working through those feelings and those difficulties that come up that maybe you're letting your dad down or letting your daughters down. But in the moment, it's a moment to moment and recognizing what is in your control at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I have a question for you. And I'm curious, um, even as a medical professional, what were some resources that you had very little information on? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, like I shared, I, I'm, I was a whole physician, but I think what I didn't realize is how challenging it would be. Um, I realized that in pediatrics, things are just different when you're taking care of kids. And so I was really kind of surprised at the way that my dad was treated by healthcare professionals, some of them, not all of them, the way that I was treated um, and really just having to learn how to advocate for him and how to speak up and and make sure that he was getting the care that he needed. I think in terms of caregiver resources, you know, in full transparency, because of all the challenges that I just mentioned, I, I'm sad to say that I wasn't really aware of resources like the American Kidney Fund and some of the many caregiver 
organizations that provide support. I became aware of all of those things after my caregiving journey was over and, and after my dad passed away. And so, you know, it's something that I talk about a lot when I'm speaking to fellow caregivers, because there was, there was a lot of help and there were resources that were available, but I just didn't know about them because I was, you know, had my head down and, and was trying to just get through uh, day by day. So I, I really found out about a lot of the resources after the fact. But like Deborah, the resources that I did tap into in those moments were absolutely my family, um, my church family as well. You know, my, my congregation was a big source of support. Other family members, in addition to my sisters, were big sources of support and also friends. You know, I have really good friends who would check in and say, what do you need? How can I help you? And so those resources were invaluable. Yeah, um, the resources that were available to you and then along the journey, learning more about the kidney community and what other resources are out there and utilizing those mm -hmm. to maximize as much support as possible that you can get. Um, my next question for you is, um, how did you balance being a daughter as opposed to a medical practitioner and what situations caused you to switch roles? That's a great question. And this, this was truly the source of my frustration. When I first started caring for my dad, I didn't tell the healthcare professionals that I was a doctor because frankly, I didn't think that it mattered. And I didn't think that they needed to know that information. And so I just showed up as his daughter. And as the daughter, as the family caregiver sitting in the extra chair in the exam room, I was ignored and dismissed um, the majority of the time because I am also a physician and because I'm his daughter and you know I know my dad, I could see subtle changes in his behavior and subtle changes in his health you know, before they would maybe show up on a medical test or an exam. And so I would try to uh, pitch in, jump in and give some information to the medical team about maybe symptoms that my dad was having or side effects. And um, you know, I get it because I am a physician, so limited time, you know, it's very difficult when you have a short amount of time with the patient to have the family caregiver say um, one more thing and one more thing. Um, but I just really found that I was dismissed and that my dad's concerns were dismissed. And so one day in a moment of frustration, I, I announced that I was a, a physician. And L, like you would have thought that some magic wand was waved mm -hmm. and it's like everything shifted. Um, I remembered specifically the doctor had stood and was about to leave the room, turned back around, sat back down, leaned in, and the entire encounter was different. Um, I was, you know, it was like now there was this sudden interest in what I had to say. And while I appreciated that, um, it just made me think about the fact that most people don't have a daughter who happens to also be a doctor or a nurse or another healthcare professional. And it actually angered me that suddenly, you know, I was given this new level of respect um, because I was a doctor and not because I was the daughter of, of this wonderful man, you know, with, with kidney disease. Um, and so I would have to really figure out from that moment on, you know, I had to decide, am I going to announce every doctor's appointment, every emergency department visit? Am I going to come into the room saying I'm a doctor or am I going to kind of sit back and see how things go? And it all depended. You know, if I felt like things were going well, I didn't always share that I was a physician, but I did learn that I needed to keep that physician hat on at all times, even if I wasn't vocalizing that, um, because I just found that there were things that were slipping through the cracks. There were communication gaps between his providers. And so I always kept that doctor hat on. Um, whether or not I shared it or not would depend on whether I felt it was necessary. Yeah, it's interesting to see um, your your journey, the start of your journey, being a medical professional to then being a caregiver and taking on different roles and then recognizing through your journey that like, oh, you actually have to wear different hats depending on the situation that calls for either more advocacy or more more attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Rochester. Thank um, you you're welcome. And if you're just joining us now, welcome to our session for supporting loved ones with kidney disease, the tale of a care partner. You can type your questions and comments um, <clears throat> to the right of the chat box, and we will try to get to your questions during the, our Q&A segment at the end of this talk. Now, I'd like to turn it over to uh, 
Sashay Walker, whose son was diagnosed with FSGS at a young age. Sashay, what is your experience like as a primary care caretaker for your son, Aiden? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, our experience with kidney disease specifically started in 2017. Um, Aiden is 15 years old, and that's my boo boo right there in the blue shirt. Um, he is my kidney warrior, as we call him. Um, but he was diagnosed at birth with, with hydrocephalus. So he had a VP shunt from birth to 2017 um, when we found the kidney disease. So we weren't strangers to chronic illness, but Aiden has a very mild form of hydrocephalus and he had only been in the hospital two times in his entire life. And that was for the initial surgery and one shunt revision. So when he was diagnosed with kidney disease in 2007, um, 2017, um, he progressed very, very quickly. Um, we were first diagnosed uh, with minimal change disease. Aiden had been puffy and swollen for a few days and his dad and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So we took him to the ER and after a few days and some lab tests, he was diagnosed with minimal change disease at the beginning of 2017. Um, and then after a few weeks, nothing was working. We were on prednisone, we were on all these diuretics. Um, so for us, we couldn't figure out what we were doing wrong. And at that point, I didn't know what questions to ask. And so I'd started reaching out on Facebook and I was contacted. Uh, somebody gave me the contact information for NEFCARE Kidney International. And I started talking to them about, well, what questions do I need to ask? I know my son has this disease that falls under this umbrella of nephrotic syndrome. What am I supposed to do? And so the great thing is I was contacted, I was put in contact with them. I was also put in contact with um, National Kidney Foundation and some other local um, organizations that specialize in helping families with children of chronic illness. And we were kind of able to start figuring out his proper care plan. Um, unfortunately for Aiden, his kidneys failed within six months of his diagnosis. And my sweet baby was on dialysis at um, eight years old. And um, that was quite terrifying. Um, actually, and because he has an aggressive form of recurrent FSGS, which means it comes back every time um, you get a transplant, um, FSGS causes the filters in the kidney to deteriorate. So basically, his kidneys just keep going bad over and over again. So he got um, his first transplant in 2018, and that went very well. Um, it was a successful procedure, but the kidney disease came back in four days. Within four days of transplant, he was back having high blood pressure, back having edema, unable to keep his blood pressure um, and his weight under control. We were having every, we've had every complication known to man. We've done PD dialysis, peritoneal. We've done hemodialysis. We've got, he's gotten peritonitis. And because he has a shunt and the tubing is in his belly, it traveled to his brain and then it turned into viral meningitis. And so, He's had a lot of complications along the way, but my goal um, is to, as a parent is to always know how to advocate for him, always know how to answer questions, but also ask, ask questions. And what I say by answer questions is as a caregiver, I had to learn quickly how to memorize his medical history and Google every term that I could uh, when the doctors um, weren't around. Um, as Deborah spoke about, they tell you not to Google, but sometimes when you're in these consultations, it's intimidating to speak up because you don't know what terms are actually being used. So in order to get a better understanding, you end up doing a lot of Googling at home and that's natural, especially if you're a parent, you're going to, to Google, but also make sure you follow up that Googling with some proper education, speaking to your doctors, speaking to clinicians, speaking to social workers who can get you um, in contact with, with, with doctors. All those things are really important. And I felt like I had to learn those things quickly in order to make sure that he got the most, the, the, the best care. Um, also, in terms of being an employee, that is still a struggle. I work as a private chef. Um, I work with professional athletes. 
I work with high profile people. So really kind of wealthy people that want somebody in home cooking for them every day. I sign a lot of non-disclosure agreements, you know, um, I travel for work. So for me, when Aiden was first diagnosed, I was a young chef. I was right out of culinary school. I'd, I'd only been out of culinary school like three or four years. So I was still very new in my career. I was working at this James Beard nominated restaurant. We had all this national attention. I was cooking for celebrities in this restaurant. It was a very cool experience. And all that had to come to a halt. I had to give up my apartment because Aiden's first admission, um, once he was diagnosed, we were in the, in the hospital for nine months and we never went home. So I had to quit my job and I had to save my money. I had to give up my apartment, put things in storage, couch surf with friends until I could find a position that I could work full time and make money and allow me to have the flexibility. So with having to give up so much in my culinary career, even now I'm working with professional athletes and celebrities and I've taken a leave of absence because Aiden's been in the hospital three months, you know, even now that's still a struggle. Um, and it's, it, it's, it gets very difficult and it gets very easy to get down on yourself about not being available to everybody. But one thing chronic illness will teach you is that you're not meant to be available to everybody. You're meant to be available to the person that you're caring for and everybody else around you has to adjust. And so with that, um, advocating has become a huge part of our journey because I was contacted and put in contact with these organizations so early, I was able to figure out the language that I needed to speak to help me understand the doctors and the doctors understand me, you know, vice versa, so that we could come up with a comprehensive care plan that worked for Aiden consistently. So because I cook, my biggest issue was the diet. I could not understand why the diet was so lacking flavor and so bland when just because you have chronic illness doesn't mean you don't deserve to eat good food. So my biggest thing was figuring out the food because explaining to an eight-year-old that they cannot have ketchup when that is a main food group was a real struggle in our household. So I worked a lot with Nefcare Kidney International. We put out a low sodium cookbook for, to their patient network. I do a lot of healthy meal prep. I live a low sodium lifestyle at this point. So everybody is just gonna have to get used to it because remember it is for them to adjust to you, not the other way around. And I do a lot of speaking as much as I possibly can about the importance of advocating for yourself, advocating for your child and learning how to separate the emotion from the decision making so that you can be confident in whatever path you set for your child's um, care plan. So that is basically how I've kind of managed to keep my sanity while 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 being a caregiver. Um, I co-parent with his father. So, you know, even with co-parenting, that can be difficult. It's made even more difficult when you're um, co-parenting. Um, already, but you know, we're both in blended households now. I have a toddler as well now. And so she's learned all the things about meds and shots and, you know, all of all of the nuances of um, chronic illness. And so from advocating, I've even tried to expand myself and kind of bridge that more into my work of, um, you know, trying to start a podcast trying to help other people that are in my situation, trying to help people understand the importance of, of caregiving and how we are in a unique position as caregivers, not just when it's your child, but if it's your father, if it's your husband, you know, whoever it is for you, um, I'm trying to put together um, a community where we can talk, right? Because at some point, Sometimes you just want to talk to somebody that's in your situation. And for me, that was impossible to find. And so I've taken my passion for food and my passion for advocating, and I've kind of brought it into this community that I'm creating um, because chronic chaos is really the only way to live when you're a caregiver with for someone with a chronic illness, uh, everything is chaotic and everything is chronic. And it is a cycle of foolishness that we are living in. And so my first episode of the podcast will be dropping this week. It'll be available on all platforms. Um, it's called Chronic Chaos Podcast. Uh, if you're interested in 
and having questions answered and calling in, you know, you can shoot me an email um, at chefsashay at gmail.com. Um, if you like healthy tips and tricks, you can also shoot me an email. Or if you just want to vent, you can shoot me an email because we're all kind of on this journey together. So understanding how important community is and how and how better your journey can be and how much more you can flourish when you have community has been incredibly important. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your story, uh, Sashe, and for the advocacy work that you're doing. I think it's incredible that you've been able to start this podcast, and I very much look forward to do, um, being a part of that, listening on in, on that uh, podcast. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Now, um, I'd like to transition this over to Dr. Rochester. Um, she had mentioned, uh, you had mentioned that your healthcare experiences as a care partner for your dad had an influence on your decision to begin GPS Doc. Can you share with us that journey and what it means for you to be in this role? Sure, thank you, Elle. Well, I think, you know, listening to Deborah and Sashay's story, it, it really embodies why I started your GPS Doc. Both of them are amazing and powerful advocates. You know, both of them spoke very beautifully about how they advocated for their, their family members. And, and what I realized is, you know, in these healthcare settings with my dad is that you absolutely have to advocate for yourself. And, you know, Sashay, I think mentioned this um, idea of not knowing the terminology. And, and yes, the doctors, and I've been one of those doctors that has said, don't Google it. But yet, you know, we leave family members and patients in positions where we're sometimes speaking a language that they don't understand, or we may not even be communicating um, effectively. And so uh, during that three-year caregiving journey with my dad, where there were so many instances where it was very clear to me that had I not been a physician, had I not had that inside knowledge, or even the confidence to be able to speak up or the knowledge of how the system works and knowing exactly how to escalate my concerns that my dad would have had a different outcome. And so over and over again, you know, finding yourself in these situations where it was very clear that I had a, a privilege um, by being a physician and a caregiver and, and worrying, like really worrying about what it was like for those who don't have that. And so I started my company, Your GPS Doc to really help family caregivers and patients understand and navigate the healthcare system, um, giving them the tools that they need in order to make sure that their loved one is getting the care that is necessary. And it's all the things that, that Deborah and, and Sashay mentioned. And so uh, we, I talk about the GPS system, you know, how to effectively advocate for yourself and for your loved ones in medical settings. And the G is for gathering information. And that's, again, it was mentioned beautifully by my co-panelists, this idea of looking up information. And maybe maybe Google isn't always the best resource, but sometimes it's um, you know reputable websites. Maybe it's going to NIH website or other websites like Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic. They have patient-facing and family-facing um, materials. But learning about your loved one's illness in a way that not you need to speak medical lingo per se, but in a way that allows you to effectively communicate with the care providers. Um, and then the P is to position yourself as the expert, because as all of us have indicated today, whether or not you have a medical degree or not, you are the expert for your loved one. And you know things about them that no medical test could ever reveal. You are around them much more, you know, for much more time than any nurse or any tech or any doctor. And so walking in that power and standing in that power um, with, a, with, with respect and really positioning yourself as the expert for your loved one. And then the S is to speak up. And that's really that advocacy part, you know, speaking up when you feel that your loved one is not receiving appropriate care, um, speaking up when you feel like maybe all of the information hasn't been presented, or maybe you feel like there's information that has been glossed over, expressing your concerns. Um, and understanding that you are the expert. And so speaking up with that authority, again, but with respect and really positioning yourself as a valued member of the medical team, because family caregivers absolutely are a valued member of the medical team. And I feel like we are leveraging family caregivers more and more, a lot more of the burden and the responsibility of medical care is falling on loved ones. 
And so, you know, respecting those individuals as valued members of the medical team is incredibly important. So it's it's been uh, a real pleasure and honor to be able to work with family caregivers and, and helping them to sometimes it's formulate questions for upcoming appointments, plan for medical appointments. Sometimes it's being their voice in medical settings and then other times it's empowering them so that they can use their voice more effectively. And ultimately it's to make sure that our loved ones are receiving the best medical care that they possibly can. Thank you so much, Dr. Rochester, for sharing those great tips with us. Um, mm -hmm. I'd I like to touch upon briefly what you shared earlier about navigating the healthcare system and experiences of feeling ignored or dismissed. And can you talk a little bit more about the medical biases that you experience? Sure. This, some of this are things that I've unpacked after my experience and certainly in the work that I do now with, with health equity. Um, I, I, as much as I would love to believe that my dismissal and my invisibility and my dad's concerns being ignored um, had nothing to do with our race, we know that unfortunately that's not the case. And certainly in our country, there are lots of health disparities, health inequities, um, such that members of marginalized communities, whether that's because of your race or your socioeconomic status or your religion or your sexual orientation or your gender um, or your disability status, all of these things, unfortunately, cause disparities, not only in outcomes, but disparities in care. And so um, I have to acknowledge that some of those things are what came into play. And the reality is that all of us have biases. Every human has a bias. Uh, or multiple biases. And many of these biases that we have are unconscious. So we're not aware of them. And it doesn't make us bad people. It's literally the way that our brains are wired. Um, but most people don't recognize those biases. And um, certainly there's a, we, we don't want to think or believe that these exist among healthcare providers. But again, because healthcare providers are human, they, they have these biases. And so it's the kind of things where um, someone may look at you and assume based on your race or your ethnicity or whether or not you speak the language uh, well, they may assume that you know, there's a, your, your intelligence level is lower or they may assume that you can't understand certain things. They may, un they may assume that you can't uh, afford certain medications. They may assume that you're not gonna be compliant with certain medications. And so there's lots and lots of studies and evidence that show that um, these biases really interfere with the provision of quality care. And this is just another reason why um, all caregivers and particularly people caring for individuals who have marginalized identities, they need to speak up even more to overcome um, some of these biases that show up in the healthcare environment. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important to have more conversations and awareness about the medical biases that patients, caregivers experience. I um, mean, you know, and it's not to criticize medical professionals, but it's more about creating conversations on how um, how patient and provider can interact effectively for quality of care for for both people to create that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Dr. Rochester, and um, thank you to all the panelists for sharing your experiences. Um, your stories have been valuable to hear about, and so now I'd like to turn it to the audience members for their questions. And so one question that we have from the audience um, is, I work as a social worker at a dialysis center. I want to ask how much contact you as caregivers have or had with your loved one's social worker and whether you felt it was adequate or if you would have preferred more or less. And I think this is a question for all of the panel panelists, who, whoever would like to answer since you all experienced dialysis with your loved ones. I'll go first. Um, with having a kid on dialysis, it's, it's, it's a little different um, because the caregiver, the, the social worker is kind of like the parent's BFF in the fight. So they help you keep, it's not just about 
providing resources for managing your home, but our social worker helps a lot with keeping Aiden engaged with his own medical care. So they come up with creative games for the kids, right? So for example, when you have chronic um, kidney disease or rare kidney disease like Aiden, you're on a fluid restriction. So they do little games for how well are you managing your fluid restriction? Okay, if you go three months without going over your limit, you get a prize. They, they provide mm -hmm. games as well as training as the kids get older for them to be able to better cope with taking care of their, themselves when they do become adults. So my social worker experiences have been fantastic. We were living in Chicago when Aiden was first diagnosed. We've since moved to Michigan. So on both sides, the, the social workers on both teams before they we moved coordinated everything. The social worker was the first person I met before I moved to Michigan. They helped us set up all of his appointments. They helped us find community resources. When I wasn't able to work and I could only take care of him, they helped me find financial support for myself so that we didn't come unhoused at any point. And so for me, the social worker, I know that they say they work for the patient. They really work for the parent. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful experience that I've had being able to care for him while also keeping my emotions in check enough to be the primary decision maker. Well, I can say, I, I feel like I had limited interaction with my dad's um, social worker at the dialysis center. However, there was one really, really important encounter that really shifted um, things for my dad. And that was, um, so my dad was quite meticulous with his appearance and with his grooming and, um, we weren't seeing him every day and we had arranged transportation for my dad to go to dialysis. This is before we had to kind of move him into an assisted living facility and he was still living on his own. And the social worker at the dialysis center reached out to me and my sisters and asked if she could meet with us. And so we went into the dialysis center one afternoon and what she shared was that she had, having known my dad for the last year or two, she saw a difference in how he was showing up to his dialysis appointments. And she said like, you know, he's just not, your dad's just not his normal self. And, you know, it, it seems like he's not paying as, as close attention to his grooming. Sometimes his clothing looks like it may or may not be, you know, clean and like that was not my dad at all. And those are things that we wouldn't have known because when we would go see him, I guess he would get pr more prepared for us coming over. And so she actually said, you know, I think your dad may be depressed and she was absolutely right. And so that intervention and her knowing my dad and, and fought, seeing that change and then having the heart to reach out to us and let us know allowed us to then get my dad, you know, mental health treatment and, and, and things to address the depression that I think accompanies a lot of patients who are undergoing dialysis. So I will never, ever forget that. And, and that was like very, very important to me and my family. Okay, I go. Um, my social worker, Foster, I hope I can say his name, he was wonderful. I, uh, for over two years, I think I probably talked to him more than I talked to my own husband. Every day we were emailing or phone calls or communicating. I am truly Dr. Rochester's GPS. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm totally like that. When I saw that, I was like, that's me. So in saying all of that, um, Foster never, my social, my husband's social worker was never uh, uh, mean or he always took my questions. If he was in a meeting, he called me back. Um, a lot of times um, when we would travel, because I told my husband, I said, we will not let amputations, we will not let kidney disease, we will not let anything stop us from living. So when we would travel, um, I would speak with my husband's social worker, please find us a good uh, dialysis center in a good spot. And then once he found it, I looked it up and if I didn't like it, he'd go back to the drawing board and find us another one. So my um, husband's social worker was great with uh, that open communication and allowed me to um, express my opinions and um, he, he was just there doing things for us. Um, when I first spoke, I mentioned how uh, grueling it was to try to get my husband to dialysis. Foster and I spoke probably every day on 
um, when are we going to be able to get him on the bus so he can go to a different dialysis center? And he'll say, I'm working on it, Miss Deborah. I'm going to take care of it. But he never got upset. He always took my calls. So it was a wonderful experience for me with the social worker. Yeah, thank you all for sharing. I think what I'm picking up is that more social work interaction is preferred, is, yes. is, um, is helpful. Now, our next question goes to Dr. Rochester. Um, and the question is, the first session of today discussed health disparities experienced in the minority communities. What influence could that have on how much I can help provide my loved one? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'm a, I don't want to assume, but I'm assuming that the person who asked this question is a member of a minority community. And so I'm going to answer the question from, from that perspective. And I definitely don't want anyone who um, represents a minority community or a marginalized community to feel like, therefore, there's nothing you can do because we have these health disparities and, and is this is just life because they're wrong. And more importantly, they are preventable and they are avoidable. And so, you know, from my perspective, as someone who does health equity consulting and as a black woman and as a former caregiver, you know, I'm wearing all these hats when I'm thinking about health disparities. And I think the main thing I want to say to caregivers is that there are a lot of things that the system needs to do to um, to change, to improve. There's a lot of things that need to happen to enable healthcare providers to provide better care. Um, and from a family caregiver perspective, I think what you all can do, or, the, or really what Deborah and Sashay and I have been talking about um, over these last, you know, 45, 50 minutes, and that's advocacy and, you know, learning about your loved one's medical illness and showing up for them, going to bat for them, um, being knowledgeable. You know, they both talked about having to learn. They're not physicians, they're not nurses, but they are very much empowered, very much educated about their loved one's illness. And I can guarantee you that their loved ones are getting better care because of them. And the same is true for those of you who are, are watching. And so never underestimate the, the, po the power that you have, the knowledge that you have, the experience that you have as a family caregiver. And so that, that really would be my best advice in terms of helping your loved one is just being there as much as you can, speaking up, educating yourself, and um, and just you know forming a partnership with the medical team. I definitely don't want to suggest that this should be some type of adversarial relationship because it really shouldn't be. Um, but really having a goal to really be in relationship with the doctors and the nurses and the social workers and the other members of the medical team so that you're all partnering to get the best care for your loved one. Yes, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Rochester. Now, um, with the time that we do have left, I would like to turn it all to you guys. And if you can share one key takeaway from your experiences today as a care partner for the audience. I'll go first. Um, my biggest takeaway from being a caregiver is honestly learning that people pleasing is not going to make anything better for anybody. It just stresses you out more. Whether you are trying to people please at work because your availability is now compromised, whether you're trying to people please at home because you're spending more time caring from what, for one child versus the other children or your partner, or whether you're people pleasing with family and friends. Because one thing people don't talk about a lot is the strain that it puts on what you're already used to and what you're already comfortable with. I feel a lot of guilt that all my family ever comes to visit me and I never go visit them because Aiden lives in the hospital a lot of time and we don't have the flexibility to travel. So everybody's kind of adjusted and they always come see us. And that has made me really, really, really guilty over the years of, oh, I'm pulling too hard on my family. And my therapist had to help me realize, no, that's what support feels like. They're just supporting you. You're so used to having to consider everyone else's feelings all the time because you're a woman, because you're a black woman, because you're an entrepreneur, because you're in an industry that doesn't 
always respect people that look like you. You're so used to doing everything that keeps everyone else happy. And at the end of the day, when your child is in a position like Aiden, where he has chronic illness, for him specifically, multiple chronic Ill illnesses, you know, the only person that I have to people please is myself. Because at the end of the day, my responsibility to take care of him will not be compromised because I'm so worried about the opinions and feelings of other people. So that has been, I'm still going through it now. I haven't perfected it, but it has gotten better over the years. Stay narrow-minded. There's nothing wrong with staying narrow-minded on this journey in order to keep your sanity. Yeah, that's, a, that's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> what about you, Deborah? What would you say a takeaway point you like to share is? Um, my biggest uh, takeaway is that um, we're in this together. From hearing uh, from Dr. Rochester and Dr. S and uh, Sachet, um, I, I realized that we are in this together. My uh, speak up attitude is what it should have been all the time, which I never changed for anyone anyway. But just knowing and hearing that confirmation that you did the right thing. My husband's uh, doctors and nurses, no matter where we went, they would always say, Deborah, if I ever get sick, I want you to be my advocate because you're going to get it done. And I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying it just makes me feel so good that I knew I was doing the right thing by questioning and questioning it in the right way and letting those doctors know that I was there for my husband and nothing, no one can do would take me away from that position and, um, or, or stop me from asking questions. So it was just such, even though it was a grueling experience, it was a great experience. And today's experience was great. I just learned so much from everyone and it was just so enjoyable to hear everyone speak and talk about what they their journey was and, and how they handled everything. And I always stay popped. Thank, Thank you, you, Deborah. And what about you, Dr. Rochester? My biggest takeaway from being a family caregiver uh, was learning how to ask for help. I am a, I, I say I'm a recovering control freak and a recovering perfectionist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just used to doing things on my own, feeling like I had to do things on my own and not feeling comfortable reaching out. And and like Sashay and Deborah have mentioned, like there are people in, in our lives and who want to help us. And, um, and so that was hard for me. It, I, I think I saw it as like a vulnerability and now I see it as a superpower. So yeah, ask for help. For those of you that are watching, if you haven't done so already, please ask for help. There are people in your life who would love to help you. Yes, thank you all for those great takeaways. On behalf of American Kidney Fund, I like to say thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing their personal experiences with us. I've been able to learn more about um, the important role of a care partner, and I want to express gratitude to our audience and our panelists for sharing their stories. Thank you for joining us during the session. I hope that you were able to learn as much as I did. And up next, we have an approach to care beyond in-center dialysis, learning about dialysis options at home. It will be streaming live at 1 p.m. Eastern time. You can follow us on Facebook or send an email through kidneyfund.org to find out more resources like this. And once we conclude this session, you will see a poll for a quick survey pop up. Your feedback and, and input is so valuable to help us plan for future sessions. So I encourage everyone to please take a minute to fill it out and tell us how we did. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.